Did you allow everything in you to bless the Lord this morning? I don't know. I don't know if we're quite there yet. I don't want to be... I'm just saying I believe we can improve. I really do. When he said, in all that is within me, I, I don't know. I mean, I could say, when, 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 we, when we all collectively, all of us, are worshiping with everything that is within, it's withholding nothing. I mean, I prayed with the worship team. I think I prayed. I think it was the worship team this morning. I, I know I prayed. I remember saying this at some point this morning that we would yield ourselves, our hands, our feet, our voices, I mean everything, that we would yield ourselves in worship unto him. And I don't know, but about the time, I don't know how, I don't know how it is for all of you, but about the time I think I'm really cutting loose, I just feel like there's more to come. And I think I think we ought to. And you know how you know how that is is how that takes place or how that is nurtured. I really believe a lot of it is just recognizing the blessings of God, the the life of God. Just be just being just learning, and it is a process of learning to be thankful on a day in day out basis. You know, I try to start my day and end my day. And anything in between, which just I, I'm really focusing, and spo I'm, I'm getting it out of my mouth. I'm thanking God, and I'm, I go through. I mean, at home, you know, I'm I'm I, I'm just so thankful for so much. Uh, I thank God every day for my, our home. Uh, I brought home a, a little plaque. I don't know, little, but it's about about like that, and about that wide, and that I found overseas. And I, I, I suspect it probably might have been made, <laughs> amazing thing, maybe it was made in China or something, I don't know. <laughs> but I liked it. And I said, and it says this, what I like most about my home is who I share it with. Yeah. I'm thankful for my home. I'm thankful that our home, our house is paid off. Yeah. I thank God Every day. I mean, I don't think there's a day go by as I don't thank him about that. I thank God. I just go through the list. I mean, I thank God for my family. I, I thank God. I, I, mention all, I may not mention every one of you every day, but every one of you get mentioned, and I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for what you do. I'm thankful you're, that you're saved. I'm thankful that God's put you here. I'm, I, I'm just thankful. I am learning and training myself. I said, Holy Spirit, I pray on a daily basis. Remind me to be thankful. Thankful people are pleasant people. Thankful people are, are, are pleasant to be around. A lot of times, you know, I ask people, you know, we all do. We make have these little things. We ask people sometimes, and we don't really, we don't even really wait for an answer. You know, you pass somebody, hi, Allison, how you doing? And we just keep walking. Yeah. But sometimes I'll say, hey, how you doing to somebody? And they'll say, well, you know, can't complain. I say, well, good. I always say, I say, well, good. Nobody wants to listen if you do. I mean, is there anybody that wants to listen to somebody complain? No. I don't. I mean, there's, I've learned there's just some people I don't, I don't really want to ask how they are. I've learned that. I just say, hi. Love you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> keep going. But the more thankful we are, because, see, that's what praise is. Right. The fruit of our lips giving thanks. And if we learn on a day-in, day-out basis, I mean seven days a week, 24 hours a day, if we focus on being thankful, you know what that will do to our worship? You know what that will do to our, our praise? Man, you come in here and you've been thankful all week, and then, and then you get up there on, you know, we get up there and, and start into the praise and worship. You, you just, man, it just, it's, it's, it's like, it's like pulling the plug out of the dam. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So uh, be thankful. I, I'm just believing for more and more and more, and I'm believing for great things. I believe that days of glory are upon us. Um, I could, I, there's just a lot of things that I could share and talk about, but I'm going to get into the message this morning as quickly as I can. All of that to that, just you know, about being thankful and praise was... Uh, 
just a little word of encouragement to all of us. I think all of us, I don't know about you, I want more. I'm, I'm just... There's, I guess I'm going to put it this way because there's a difference. I, I guess there's a part of me that's content but not satisfied. I'm, I, I know what God's doing in our midst. I know what God has done in our midst. I know what he's going to do. And my wife, you know, she got a, a word. I, think, I don't know if she used it this morning. I, I, uh, I was back, I, you know, and I knew, and I, I knew I was going to lead worship this morning. I haven't done that for... I don't know, ages and ages, long, long time. And uh, I have to be honest with you, I've just, you put me up here, I can, I can get in front of 5,000 people and it just doesn't bother me. It really doesn't. <laughs> you, put, you put that microphone back in my hand to lead worship and I'm going, oh Lord, I need grace. I need grace in everything. I told him, I said, Lord, I know that I need help in anything and everything. I understand that. But Lord, when I know that it's something that you've really called me and graced me to do, it's just, I don't know, I just don't, I don't, I don't get uh, whatever. I mean, I just, I just have probably a lot more confidence. But um, I was sitting back there, in the, and so I was sitting back in the prayer room, and, and uh, my wife and I had talked earlier, and I know she'd gotten that prophecy. We had a prophecy that, uh, that was given at the anniversary, and she, uh, she came and said, you got it on my desk? I said, somewhere. Luckily, it was on top of one of the piles. <laughs> Easy to find. My desk is an absolute mess right now. And I did straighten it up a little bit the other day, and it didn't take long, and it didn't look like I touched it. But anyway, so I was sitting back there, but I did hear some of it, and it, you should have gotten encouraged, and you should have gotten helped. And, you know, uh, I am very fortunate to be married uh, to an anointed woman. And I appreciate it. I'm very thankful. I thank God every day for her. Thank God every day for my family. I mention all my family by name. My sons, my daughters. Well, Pastor, you don't have any sons. Yes, I do. I got four of them. You know, uh, David. I can tell you all their names, too. Uh, David and Eric and Nate and Lance. And... Uh, Thankful for my grandson, my, uh, you know, grandson. I got, I got uh, Drew and Race, and I got granddaughters in, in Annika in Brooklyn. Is that everybody? I, I have some friends that say they have like, you know, 19, 20 grandchildren, and even some great grandchildren. I think, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very thankful, but I remember I'll tell you a little story, true story. I told a couple of you. Last week, I was back in the prayer room, and of course, Eric was in here preaching and ministering the word. And how many of you remember? I, am not, I shouldn't ask how many of you remember what he preached on. I can tell you. He was preaching on uh, releasing what they talk about what's inside us and releasing what's inside us. And it'll only, it'll wear you out trying to hold it back. So I'm coming up the hallway, and I'm headed for the restroom. And, uh, you know, I, I, I got to go. I had a couple cups of, you know, I, I think a cup of tea, a cup of coffee and all that. And just as I got into the restroom, I opened the door to the men's restroom. And, of course, we have speakers in there. So none of you, you know, you can't go hide in the restroom to get away from the word. <laughs> in the men's and women's. And so I opened that door and I'm walking in and here's Eric coming across the speaker. You've got to release what's on the inside of you. It'll only wear you out, holding it back. And I'm going, amen to that, brother. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I didn't need the instruction, but I receive it. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Turn with me in your Bibles to Second Chronicles. Woo! Yeah, somebody can say woo-hoo or something. I don't know. You do have a Bible with you. Amen. I'd ask you, I, I'm going to just check this out. I'm going to check this out. Everybody hold your Bible up. Wow. No phones, no computers or iPad. I like it that you learned to carry a Bible. 
Give God another shout. Come on. Are you in 2 Chronicles? Yes. Chapter 5. In chapter 5, they're bringing the ark into the temple, and of course, with the ark. Uh, the ark was representative of the presence of God. And above the ark, we know there was the mercy seat, and uh, we know what was in the ark. And it says, uh, verse 7, Let's, I, I guess we'll start at verse 7. They were, well, verse 6 talks about they were, bringing, they were bringing the ark in and they were before the ark and uh, offering sacrifices that, were, that couldn't even be numbered for multitude. And then the priest brought in the ark of the covenant. Say ark of the covenant. Ark of the covenant. Which covenant is this? Which covenant are they speaking about there? The old, the old covenant, which was what? Law. It was law. And if we, uh, I'll show you in a little while, but th I want you to remember that. This was under the Old Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place, into the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherub cherubim spread their wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubim overshadowed the Ark in its poles. And the poles extended so the ends of the poles of the Ark could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside, and they were there to this day. Nothing, say nothing. Nothing, nothing was in the Ark except the two tablets which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they come to Egypt. Now, what was there? The, the two tablets of stone... When the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel. What covenant is that? The old covenant, the old covenant which is what? Law. law. And we know that the law could make no one perfect. That's right. yeah. All the law did was condemn, and, sh and it, was, it was given, in fact, with the intent so that man could understand his condition before the Lord, could understand how sinful sin was. Man was living in a, in a situation and a circumstance prior to the law that would have sent them to hell, that they, would have, they had no hope, but sin cannot be imputed without acknowledging it or law of it or recognition of it. So God gave the law to point out men's sins and how dangerous, how destructive it was. Amen? Amen. So really, the law as such, was a ministry of condemnation. Okay? Are you with me? Okay. And it came to pass, when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests were present and sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions, and the Levites, who were singers, and all those of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, Stringed instruments, cymbals. That's a percussion instrument. I just want, I just, I made note of that for a reason. Listen to me. Don't you move. The Bible says that with everything, that is in us and is everything at our disposal. We worship God. People have tried to tell me, well, you know, drums and cymbals do not belong in church. I said, really? I said, yeah, I can't find them in the Bible. I, it looks to me like you can find them in the Bible. I, I always joke when I, get to, when I do get to lead worship, and I don't mind leading worship once in a, in a while. In fact, probably going to happen a time or two before the year is over. But I always joke with the worship team at the end. We get, I said, now, is this a, is this a what, what do I call that? Is this a, uh, what do you call it when you're done? Is this a rap? No. You know, I, so I check. I says, uh, I look over at Marshall. I says, is the percussion system, the percussion section, okay? And Marshall, yeah, shakes his head. Well, the thing is, that's really all we have is a percussion si section. Right. I understand that those two keyboards up there are electronic, but if you know music and all that, Pianos are actually percussion. 
you're hitting a key, and the key makes a, on a regular piano, makes this little hammer go down and hit the string, and that, that caught. So it's really not a string thing, it's a percussion thing. Now, you know, a string thing is a guitar or a violin and all that, but, so I, but I always turn and say, you know, how is a, how's the percussion system? We okay and all that? Yeah. I turned to Connie and, and Renee, and I says, you know, I said, I'm, I said, I don't really want to call you a percussion se uh, section. I said, so, but sometimes I says, okay, how are you guys doing? <laughs> yep, we're fine. Okay. I said, well, pray for me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it says right there, boy, you're doing a good job, Chris. You didn't fall asleep, did you? Okay, that's about as still as I've seen you sit for a while. <laughs> With their cymbals, their stringed instruments, their harps, and with them, 120 priests sounding the trumpet. You know what? Stop and think. Now, we're talking, we're not talking the trumpets like Phil plays. You know, we're talking shofar horns. That's what would have been considered a trumpet back then. But 120, now we got, we got cymbals, and we got stringed instruments, and we got harps. And with them, 120 priests sounding with trumpets. And we have two keyboards and a drum set, and some people say, wow, it's loud. <laughs> what are they going to do when they get to heaven? Well, they won't be fleshly. They get to heaven, they will, the flesh will be done with, and we'll all be spiritual, and we won't think about stupid things like that. And indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters, and the singers were as one to make one sound. Now, that tells me one thing. There were no performers. They weren't up there performing. They were up there worshiping. I've said it many times with our worship. Uh, I, don't need, I don't need performers up there. Now, I want musicians and singers, obviously. But I want musicians and singers that understand that their talent, whether it's to play an instrument or whether it's to sing, is simply an instrument of worship unto God. I want, I want our keyboard players not to just go up there and play. I want them to go up there and allow their fingers to worship on the keyboards. And I want anyone who sings, whether it's myself, whether it's Eric, or anybody we would put up there, uh, I love good voices. You know, Eric's got a great voice. I love great voices, but the fact is, I don't need a performer. I want a worshiper. And that's what they had here. And all those on instruments, stop and think about it. 120 trumpeters. I don't know how many stringed instruments and cymbals there were, but evidently this was, this was a pretty large group. And yet they became as one. There was nobody you know, trying to perform, trying to outdo the other one, trying to play their horn louder than the next one or anything. But they became as one to make one sound. To be heard in praising and thanking God. And when they lifted up their voices with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, they lifted up their voices along with the voices of the instruments. See, the, the, the instruments have a voice. Mm -hmm. And when all these voices, whether they were out of an instrument or whether they were out of a human vessel, when all of those instruments became as one and praised the Lord, saying, see, when you're playing under the Lord, if you're playing the piano or you're playing the keyboard or you're playing the drums or whatever it is, this is what, this is, and you're doing it in under the Lord, this is what you're saying. This is what your instruments are saying. This is what your voice, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Amen. You're acknowledging through your instrument, through your human voice, the goodness of God and the mercy of God and giving thanks unto him. This is, this is now I'm just going to tell you, I, I just, I'm just going to reaffirm this constantly because I believe that there's a lot of people in the body of Christ throughout the church in the United States in particular that don't understand this. If you really understand praise and worship and what it is, you shouldn't need all these external things like a light show and a strobe and so on and so forth. This is not a concert. It's a praise and worship service. But 
when they praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, and his mercy endures forever. All these things were one sound, and they were all saying the same thing. That the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. Oh, man, they had a, they, what they did is they had a malfunction in the heating system. Huh? So that the priests could not, the glory of the Lord, the glory cloud, the presence of God literally came into that sanctuary, into that place. Isn't that amazing? We've experienced that. I've experienced it. And uh, I think Heath was with me one time in, in a city over at that time, which was Ukraine. And, man, I mean, the presence of God was so powerful. People couldn't stand up. I mean, uh, it, was an, it was just one of the most amazing experiences. And uh, it was one of those services you don't, wanna, you don't want to end. But it, it kind of came to an end, and then the, the preachers, there were, I don't know, a handful of preachers in the front row, and then leadership, and the rest of the congregation. I don't know how many people were in there. But they, they came and they said, wow, did you see it? Well, you know, when, many times when you're preaching and, and ministering and all that, the, you're, not a, you're focused on other things. I said, see what? They said, the cloud. Did you see the cloud? I thought, see, that explained a lot of things to me. Man, the glory cloud had come into that house. And the reason that the, that the glory cloud could come in, the, let me put it this way. Let me, let me give you a couple verses. The book of Psalms says, How blessed, how pleasing. It is when brethren dwell together in what? Amen. And it goes on to say it's like the oil that runs down the beard of Aaron. In other words, the anointing. And it's like the dew of Hermon that descended upon. Uh, I should have read it, looked and read it verbatim. And it talks about, and that's a reference to the glory. When people dwell in unity, you know, there's a lot of churches... God can't show up because the, the, the contrast to that about dwelling in unity, making one voice, one sound, we're talking spiritually. The contrast to that would be James chapter 3 where there's envy and strife. There's confusion in every evil work. Do you realize, I, you know, the Bible says that where we, where we gather in his name that he'll be in our midst. That's a promise we have. And he shows up, I believe, to that extent, but as far as manifestations of his presence, of his glory, is, is, doesn't show up in a lot of those churches because there's envy and strife. Right. There's people sitting on one side of the, con of the sanctuary because there's somebody else sitting on the other side that they're not going to sit next to. People sitting there being critical of the worship team, being critical of this. Well, the ushers didn't shake my hand. Pastor looked at me when he said, you know, oh, quit it. Grow up. Amen. Grow up. Right. What are you here for? Right. Just so we can pat your back in and say, good job? Well, that's something we should do. We should encourage one another. Right. But I don't know about you, but I think we should live every day saying, Lord, what can I do better? What do I need to correct? Lord, I yield myself to you. That, that's not condemnation. That's just wanting to be everything that God, that you can be for God. Amen. The glory cloud showed up so that the priest could not even continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Wow, when the, glory, when the, when the presence of God, the glory cloud of God comes, that's the presence of God in his fullness, in, his, in manifestation, and anything that God is and anything that God has and anything that God wants to do is coming with it. <laughs> you know I like your movie lines, don't you? I got to watch what I say because there's a lot of movies I, I watch and they're edited and all that and Sometimes, so I don't know if I'm going to mention this movie by name. Maybe some of you will recognize it. I've never watched but an edited version of it. 
So I don't know what else is in it. I make that statement because I don't want you to think your pastor's out, you know, indiscriminately watching anything. My wife and I don't indiscriminately, we haven't even been to the movie theater for, and I don't know what. But in one movie, I remember this one guy shouting. He was mad and angry. He says, you tell him I'm coming. And, and he says, and hell is coming with me. I thought, wow. Well, don't come to my house. I think I might just send, I just might send a text to the churches that I go visit. And maybe I ought to just send in a, put it in an announcement sheet here. You tell him I'm coming, and heaven's coming with me. Amen. Woo! Isn't this an amazing thing? The only thing in the ark was the law. The only thing that was in it was the law. The law of condemnation, the covenant of condemnation. Really, we could call it the covenant of death. And even, what did I do with my, there it is. And, and even under that covenant, the glory showed up. Yeah. Now, there's a couple times, there's a couple times, other times that the glory shows up under the old covenant. That is an absolutely amazing thing. Now, with all of that said, I want you to go with me to the book of Corinthians. Second Corinthians, to be precise, in chapter 3. Now, I could take you back, and I, I, for sake of time, I'm not going to, but we get the, the things that Second Corinthians depicts, you will, chapter 3, you'll find back in the book of Exodus. But for sake of time, you can go back and, and read this, but Paul... In 2 Corinthians and chapter 3, highlights or, or describes what transpired back there at the giving of the law. Verse 7. No, verse 6. Mm, man, I could just read the whole, you know. Verse 6. Paul talks in verse 5, he said, Our sufficiency, our, we are not sufficient in ourselves. To think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter does what? Okay, so what is the law? It's the letter. The law is the letter. And the letter does what? Kills. But the spirit gives life. But, now watch this, verse 7. If the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones... Now, let me just... Somebody needs to hear this. The law was never intended as a means of salvation. The Bible clearly states, Old Testament, and then it states it reaffirms it in the New Testament that by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. You cannot, you could not look to the law as a means of getting to heaven because it was absolutely impossible for you to keep the law. James says, if you transgress one part of the law, it's the same as transgressing all. It doesn't mean that if you lie, you're a murderer. But the fact is, that you either had to keep the whole law, every bit of it, without absolutely any transgression of any nature, or any size. See, this is why people came up with things like, well, I, it was just a white lie. No, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. A lie is a lie. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And the law says if you lie, you die. Mm -hmm. right. Are you with me? Yeah. And so the law killed. The law was a ministry of death. Because you couldn't keep it. it wasn't, but God never intended it to be our means to get to heaven. He gave the law so that we could understand we needed some different way to get to heaven. Amen. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, 
so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Now, let me stop there for a minute and remind you. We've been talking for the last several weeks about our standing with God. That we indeed are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Our justification or our salvation, uh, justification probably is a word some people may not understand. Let me put it this way. Our acquittal of guilt, our acquittal of guilt, the proclamation of not guilty was taken care of not by our works, but by our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus took all of our sin. Say, all my sin. All my sin. He took all of our sin in his own body on the tree to the cross. And what's the, what is the wages of sin? Yeah. What's the gift of God? Yeah. That's why, see, that's why Paul says, the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. If Jesus doesn't come out of the grave, we're still in our sin. All he did was die. Yeah. Right. Romans chapter 4, I think verse 25 says, but he was raised for our justification. Mm -hmm. In taking our sin to the grave... He bore our penalty. The wages of sin is death. It was our sin he took, not his own. He didn't have any sin. So it was our sin he took to the grave. And then he rose from the dead, defeating death, hell, the grave, and the sin that was ours. And in doing so, when he raised from the dead, and we believe that he died and rose from the dead, then we are declared not guilty. Woo! Glory to God. Doesn't that feel good? Yes. I mean, it just takes any burden. It makes you feel a lot lighter on your feet. I don't know about you, but I mean, when you talk about being declared not guilty, I mean, that's just shouting stuff. Yes. That's shout. I mean, I wonder what the judge would do, what a jury would do in a courtroom if when they, they come out of that verdict and the judge reads it and says, they have found you not guilty. I wonder what they do if the old defendant would stand there, go, woo, woo, you know, just start dancing around the courtroom. That's why I don't understand Christians. My goodness. What is your problem with getting excited during praise and worship? Well, you charismatics, man, you're just, you're just an emotional group. You betcha. I've been declared not guilty, and I tell you what, Amen. pardon the expression, but I was guilty of sin. But Jesus took all that sin and all that guilt and all that condemnation to the grave when he rose from the dead. I was declared not guilty. Why shouldn't I be emotional? Amen. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Glory to God. How will not the ministry of the Spirit be more glorious than the, than the, than the, the ministry of death? We've been given life. We've been delivered from the ministry of death. We've been delivered from the, the law as a means. It was never a means. But we've been delivered from that law of death because the wages of sin was death. But the free gift of God is the what? Eternal life. Amen. And the Spirit gives life. Now, for if... It, <laughs> let me, can I quote another verse to you? Romans chapter 1. Verse 16, I'll read it. I know I can quote it, but I, I want to get absolutely every word that's in there. For I'm not ashamed of the good news of Christ. Verse 16, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who works. Huh? To who does what? Believe. Who does what? Believe. Say, I believe. I believe. For the Jew first and also for the Greek, for any and in the good news, in the gospel, the righteousness of God. Say the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. 
right standing with God has been revealed to us from faith to more faith. You know, we read that from faith to faith, and, you know, it doesn't do it justice, but if you read the Amplified, you read some different, different versions. One translation, I think the, new, the uh, Amplified says, from faith leading us to even more faith. Why? What do you mean, leading us to more faith? Because I'm in right standing with God, it increases my faith. I'm be I believe that I am in right standing with God, and believing that is where it starts. If I can believe that, then it allows me and helps me to believe for anything and everything else Amen. that God says in his word. Amen. And I can believe for it to be mine. Why? Because I'm in right standing. My, the righteousness that I have through what Jesus has done gives me a boldness to approach unto God without apology. I've been declared not guilty. I've been justified, not rationalized, but justified. Amen. So that leads me to even more faith. Whoa, I'm in right standing with God. Wow, God, what do you think about this? Can, well, I, I'd like to have this. I'd like to do this. Your word says this. Your word says I'm healed. Well, if you understand your right standing with God, then it also then increases your faith or helps your faith in believing for healing, believing for prosperity, believing for anything that God says is yours in him. Amen. Then you can understand Romans chapter 8 where it says, Will he not with him also freely give us all things? Are you with me? From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live and live by faith. So my righteousness, our standing with God, brings us into a place of right standing, which therefore gives us confidence to approach. Am I right? Yes. Okay, now go with me back to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 3. Verse 8. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, now watch this, listen. What are we? What's our standing with God? We are the what? Righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Then there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and But we read back in 2 Chronicles with nothing in that ark but the law, which was a ministry of condemnation and death, that it had glory. They brought that into the temple and the glory cloud showed up. And when Moses came down off the mountain after having received that, and that's what this is a reference to, he had such glory on him at the receiving of the law that the people could not stand to look at him. So he put a veil in front of his face. See, when you, you, can, you can't look at the glory, you can't experience the glory when you're not right with God. That's what it's saying. They couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't bear to look at him. Even though the glory was fading away, we'll see here, they couldn't look at it because their lives weren't right and they couldn't be right. But nonetheless, the glory still showed up. You go into Second Chronicles, you see it fading away on Moses, then you go to Second Chronicles, they bring the law in with all this worship and all that, and yet even though they couldn't be totally right with God, the glory still showed up. What's that tell you? God wants to manifest his glory. He wants to, man himself, to manifest himself to his people. Are you with me? Now, watch this. Let's read on. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, 
who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Even though it was fading and passing away, they still couldn't look at it. They were hindered. Why? Because their hearts weren't right. Their lives weren't right with God. And they couldn't be right. But it's amazing. You go to that second passage in Second Chronicles, there's a passage in Kings, but the glory still showed up, even though it was a ministry of condemnation and death. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. So even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, say nevertheless. nevertheless. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Amen. Now the Lord is a spirit. There's a lot of people read this and they don't understand what it's saying here, I think. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty to do what? Liberty to look into the things of God, to look upon the glory of God, and to receive absolutely anything and everything that God has for us because we've been put in right standing with God. We understand who we are in Christ Jesus, and therefore we have liberty to experience what God has for us and what God has done for us. Amen. It doesn't have anything to do with your stupid flesh other than your flesh has been dealt with. And now in Christ Jesus, you have the liberty to experience what God has for us. You have liberty and have a right and a confidence to experience the glory of God in your life, in your home, and in our ministry. Amen. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, how many know the Spirit of the Lord is here? Why? Because he, we're here. But we all with unveiled face, in other words, without restriction, without fear. You know, they said in Luke chapter 1, uh, at the, concerning the birth of Jesus, they said that we may serve him, we having been delivered from the hand of our enemies, may serve him without fear. Luke chapter 1, I think, verse 74. So the fear to approach God is gone. The fear to serve God is gone. Why? Because Jesus took care of all of that. We can approach unto God with boldness. We can go into the Holy of Holies. Under the law, the only one that could go into the presence of God was the high priest once a year. And he had to go with blood. Because if he didn't go with blood or the right blood and do it the way God said, he didn't come back out alive. If you really, when you research all this, they find, you find out that that priest that went into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, once a year, it got to the point where they would tie a rope around his ankle with a bell on it. And if he didn't come out and the bell, they quit hearing that bell, they knew he died. Well, how could that be possible? He's in the presence of God. Because the thing in the, in the ark was those tablets, which was a ministry of death, and condemnation. But we, with unveiled face, with the restrictions removed, we can go into the Holy of Holies. We have a right of expectation. Why? Because it's not a ministry of death. It's a ministry of life. It's a ministry of righteousness. It's a ministry of the Spirit. We all, with unveiled face, we don't have to fear. We've been made right with God through the sacrifice of our Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb, without spot, without blemish, took upon our sins took our sins upon himself, mm -hmm. bearing the judgment of our sin, bearing our sicknesses and diseases, and he carried our pain. The chastisement needful for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. healed. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. 
He bore all of our sins in his own body on the tree. Therefore, we being dead to sin and alive unto righteousness, and by his stripes we are healed, 1 Peter 2, 24. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. Watch this. From glory to glory. In the same way that we've gone from faith to ever-increasing faith, because of our standing with God, because of our acquittal, we go from glory to ever-increasing glory. We have the full right by faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Well, all things are possible to him who believes. Jesus told Mary and Martha, he said, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you'd see the glory of God? Well, how many of you believe today? Amen. How many of you are born again? Amen. How many of you are the righteousness of God by faith in Christ Jesus? Amen. Then you believe. Amen. And we are being transformed or changed into the same image from, one, from glory to more glory to ever-increasing glory. I brought a couple different translations up here with me. And I'm going to read out of a couple of them. I've got, uh, and, and it just, it's just such a, a cool, cool thing. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord there is, there is there's liberty, emancipation from bondage, and, and there's freedom. Amen. And all of us, with, as with unveiled face, beholding, and all of us with unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the Word of God, as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are constantly being transfigured into His very own image in ever-increasing splendor and from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We, have, we, can, we can believe. What's believing? Having faith. We have been declared righteous by faith through Jesus Christ, or in Jesus Christ. He's given us his righteousness. So if Jesus can believe for the glory, and he said, listen, if you believe, you'll see the glory. Well, we've already believed. We believe we're the righteousness of God. We believe we're born again. We believe we're children of the Most High God. We believe that we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We believe that we've been washed from sin. We believe that we have access to the Holy of Holies. We don't have to have a veil. We can look into the things of God boldly and confidently. Well, if we can do all that, then it is just another little thing to believe to go from one glory to another glory, to see the glory of God in our homes, in our lives, Amen. to see the glory cloud flow in here. Amen. Now, I don't know. I don't know whether we will see, now listen to me, I don't know whether we will see a literal, physical manifestation of the cloud. I don't know. All I know is there's a lot of things. I, we had something happen this week again. Somebody saw something at our house, and it's really a cool thing. And there's absolutely no question about what they saw, not to me. Somebody saw, saw an angel of the Lord standing at our house. Now I said, wow, so cool, and described this angel. I said, my wife, I said, you know what? I go back, you know, I, I mean, it's a cool thing to see, but I asked the Lord one time, how can, I said, people see angels. I said, how come I don't see them, the Lord? He said, you believe that they're? I said, yeah, you know I do. He said, what do you need to see them for? Mm -hmm. Wow. So I don't know. I don't know whether we will literally, if there'll be like a fog come in here and none of us will be able to see each other, you know, and, and the weather, re weather station will put out a fog alert for uh, uh, Word of Life Outreach Center that your visibility has decreased to two feet in front of you. Be careful. I don't know that. Something tells me that probably not. All I know is the presence of God. We have a right to believe for the glory, to, for the presence of God to fill this house, to fill our lives, to fill our home. And it's going to be so great that when you go to eat afterwards or you just leave your house in the morning and go to work, people are going to say, hey, 
There'll be probably unbelievers say, I, I, I don't think, I can't look, what, what is it about you? I can't, I can't look you in the eyes. It's called the glory. And you know what? You know how easy this is going to make salvation? Evangelism? I really believe, saints, and I've said this, and I've seen it happen. I've had it happen in my life in ministry that you walk past somebody and they just get healed. I've had it happen. Not all the time yet. But isn't that what we want? Don't we want, don't we want the glory? The glory will show up. And we have a right to believe for it. We have a confidence to believe for it. The fear's been removed. God wants to show up. You know, people say, well, he wants to show up. And I, I don't know, showing off, I don't, that terminology kind of offends me because showing off kind of, I don't know, to me that kind of indicates a pride. But you need to understand where God shows up, things happen. Just supernaturally. This is why I, I, I'm always careful to, to say this and, pre, and preface the statement that I'm about to say with this. I don't have a problem with healing lines. You all know that. But do you realize when it comes to lines, and, I, you know, I'm not, we'll probably have them again. I don't know. I, I'm just going to let God be God. But do you know how much time it takes to lay hands on 200 people, let alone 5,000? I was in the service, and, and man, the Holy Spirit is moving, and I, and, and I, was, I was young. And uh, I'm preaching and all that, and I start calling things out, and there's like, if I remember right, in that particular service, there was about 3,000 people, I think. I know that in the three services, there, were six, there was one right after another, and there were 6,000 people. And it seems to me like there was about, I don't know, 3,000 people in the first one, and there was like 1,500 and then 1,000, something like that. All I remember is a lot of people. And I just gave a couple words of knowledge. I said, whoever that is, come forward. Well, <laughs> I mean, every seat in the place empty. I mean, if you just let them file past you and just do this, you know how long it takes to get 3,000 people? But when the glory shows up, and that's what's happening. That's why the Holy Spirit just, that, a word of knowledge. We have to learn to accept when a word of knowledge comes forth, and God, that's God saying, this is what I'm doing, and if that's what you got, then you receive it. Yeah. You, you know what? You, I've had services where I said, listen, uh, stand up. And then I get him stood up, and the Lord says, you better tell him to sit back down. <laughs> I, he said, yeah, because I'm going to show up, and they're not going to be able to stand, and they might hurt themselves. If they're not sitting. I said, oh, wow, cool. But see, this is what happens when the glory shows up. Those priests couldn't even continue to minister because the presence of God was so filling that house and it brought with it, the glory cloud brings with it everything that God is, everything that God has. It brings healing virtue. It brings creative power. It brings uh, uh, salvation power. I mean, it, it, everything that God is. We used to sing a song about the kingdom of God. The blind see, the deaf. We declare that the kingdom of God is here. And the blind see, the deaf hear. The lame men are walking. Sickness is flee at his voice. The dead live again and the poor hear the good news. Jesus is king, so the glory flows in. That's what happens. <laughs> Golly, oh my, my, my. Can you imagine? And it's not limited to geography. The Apostle Paul and Silas were sitting in that prison that night in, to say the least, an understatement, not in ideal circumstances. Can we, can we agree on that? And what they do? They held church. Two men that understood they're standing with God 
and because of their standing with God, had the confidence and the assurance just to begin worshiping God in the midst of those adverse circumstances. They began to sing unto God and worship God. And I want to tell you, because of their standing, because of their obedience, because of their heart, that, what do you think that was that showed up? That was the glory. Amen. The glory came into that prison, and it, it shook open absolutely every jail cell. All the doors flung open, and the, and the jailer goes, Oh, my goodness, I'm going to die. I'm, they're going to kill me. I might as well kill myself. And Paul hollers out, hey, 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 we're all here. <laughs> what happened? The guy in his whole household got born again. I mean, he came running. What do you think? The, the glory is in you. The presence of God, it'll be just like in the days, uh, uh, in that day, that night, where the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And we, we study, and, and rightly so, but sometimes we try to get this plan of salvation down of A, B, C, D. I start at A, I go to B, I go to C, go to D, and E, if I do A, B, C, and D, E is he'll pray. Wow, you know, I kind of like it that when somebody just comes and says, you knew what I about did then. And just says, Allison. What must I, I see, I see something on you, Allison. What must I do to be saved? I know my life isn't right. <laughs> wow. You don't have to go through A, B, C, and D. You just say, listen, Jesus died and rose from the dead to bring you life to bear all your sins. Pray this prayer, sucker. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wouldn't add that. Pray this prayer. Okay. Oh, Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I'm a sinner. I believe that you rose from the dead to acquit me and declare me not guilty. Amen. Come into my life. Well, how easy will that be? Yeah. See, I'm going to tell you something, saints. When the glory shows up, lives are going to be changed. Amen. You know, I really believe this. Now listen to me, and, and I'll close. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm, for, I'm for getting people saved, getting people born again. But I am ready for supernatural manifestation that when they pray and invite Jesus into their heart, that it won't take six years or six months or even six minutes to, for them to realize they're a new creature and old things are passed away. I mean, strongholds gone, habits gone. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, that's, that's the change that literally takes place in their spirit. I guess is what I'm saying is, I'm ready to see that manifested immediately in their flesh and their soul. And I believe that's what the glory will do. I believe that as we believe for this and the presence of God grows stronger and stronger, that we're going to see instant manifestation yeah. in people's life of change. Yeah. You know, the one that I always point to, that, that, that now it was, it was a process, but the change was so dramatic with that, with that brother that, you know, he, that I out from out the prison and, and I stay in touch with him. And I'll tell you what, that guy can quote almost every sermon he ever heard me preach. That the change in his life was so dramatic to go from what he used to be to what he is. And it didn't take that long. I mean, the guy just was so overcome with the presence of God and the goodness of God and the love of God and the mercy of God that he almost immediately just grew thankful and changed. I mean, the change was manifested. Now, we're all still, we're always going to be in some state or some transformation. We're always going to be changing, but the fact is I'm ready to see instantaneous things. And that's what the glory will do. And that's what we have, the covenant we have, the ministry of righteousness, the covenant of righteousness will produce the glory we have, and a glory that excels. If the glory... If the old covenant, which was a covenant and a ministry of death and condemnation, had glory, how much more Amen. of the covenant we have will excel or exceed yes. in glory?
That's why this is so very important that we understand our covenant. We understand our righteousness. We understand who we are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because God wants to show up. And if you're sitting there under condemnation of, see, the thing is, if we understand our covenant, the one translation says, it'll lead us into right living. If you understand who you are, it'll lead you into right living. But the, th the thing is, it gives you a confidence, and then we have a right. This covenant that we have, this covenant of righteousness, this ministry of righteousness, exceeds and excels in glory. If, and the contrast is, if that one had glory, even though it's passing away, if they had that kind of glory under the old covenant, the covenant of law and, de and death and condemnation, How much more? So our covenant and this ministry of the Spirit excel and exceed in glory. Now I'm going to tell you something, saints. The day. It's right now. I started out, I don't know where, at some point in the service, I, I know I said, days of glory. My wife, I heard her say in 10 o'clock, he's coming back for a church, a glorious church. Now, that's us. It's not the only one. I, you know, people watching, I don't want them to think it's only, but the fact is, it's going to be who can believe. That's right. That's right. We believe. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We have a ministry of the Spirit. We have a covenant of righteousness. And because of that, then our covenant, our ministry, our lives, if we grab onto all that will exceed and excel in glory. We have a right to believe for the glory of God. We have a right to believe that when we walk out of our door in the morning that the glory of God is upon us. And look out, world. Look out, devil. Here we come. Amen. Think about walking into your place of business, walking into your office with the glory on you. <laughs> oh, dear saint, the, 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 it's just limitless. It's just limitless. It'll change hearts. It'll change lives. Well, how do we see that, Pastor? We believe. If you believe, you'll see the glory. Amen? Does this help you today? Uh, you know, I don't think, Renee, you got that one song out, did you? I don't know. We might be able to sing it a cappella. I don't know if I can remember exactly all the words, but there's a song that we used to sing, and it's been on my heart for months, just months, and I think about it all the time. <clears throat> I don't know what key it's in. I'm, I'm going to guess because of the time it was sang and written. It's got to be either a C, a D, or a G. <laughs> and C is easy to sing, and I don't even know what if I'll be, if, but it goes... Let your glory fill this temple. Let your praises fill this vessel. Let your presence fill my heart. A melody of worship to thee. Let your glory fill. Oh, let your glory, Lord God, fill this temple. Let your praises fill every vessel. Oh, let your worship, Lord, fill our lives and our hearts. We thank you today for this word. We thank you that it's true. We thank you, Lord, that we've been set free and liberated to experience your glory. That the covenant we have with you, the glory far exceeds and excels anything, anything that the church has ever experienced at this point. And we have the confidence, we have the assurance, the faith to believe it. We believe, Lord, we believe you want to show your glory. We believe you want to show them. We believe for your presence. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your love that is everlasting. Thank you, Lord, for our standing, our righteousness that's been given to us as a gift. It's been imputed, been imputed or given unto us because we believe. Not by works of righteousness, 
but because of our faith. We believe. We believe, therefore, we've been acquitted. We've been declared righteous. We have a covenant with you through the blood and through this ministry of righteousness, this covenant of righteousness. We believe to see the glory that will exceed and excel. Oh, we thank you for it. We give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. I call you blessed today. I speak the blessing of the Lord over every one of you, over those who are watching on the Internet. If it's still on, I just speak blessing. Call you blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed in the city, blessed in the country, blessed rising up, blessed sitting down. You're the head, not the tail, above only, not beneath. And you're more than conquerors through him who loves you. And nothing can separate you from God's love, which is in Christ Jesus. Everybody give him a shout.